When someone says human drug trials, what do you picture? The silent corridors of some high-tech top security lab where patients in white gowns are hooked up to every medical machine imaginable and lie in wait for their doctors to adjust their dose? Well, I hope that's not how you see clinical research. And to be honest, in reality, it's a little less Hollywood and a lot more boring most of the time. Welcome to Good Clinical, a YouTube channel and podcast dedicated to showcasing the future of medicine and human health. I'm your host, Charles Beasley, and today we're going to turn back the clocks a little and look at what happens when clinical trials go wrong. Most of us will take our medicines without question, assuming they're safe because someone somewhere has said so. Yet every medicine you've ever taken for any disease or condition has been tested somehow. In fact, your entire medicine cabinet represents hundreds, if not thousands upon thousands of hours of testing and trialing before it gets anywhere near a patient such as yourself. The vast majority of these trials go off without a hitch, but there are cases, however, that rock the world of medical science to its core, where totally unpredicted side effects wreak havoc and doctors work around the clock to save patients from drugs that were supposed to be safe enough for human consumption. Let's take a look at some of these cases. In March 2006, six young men walked into a London hospital to take part in a drug trial that would change their lives and the future of drug trials forever. The kind of trial these guys had signed up for is called a first-in-man trial because, well, it was the first time that this drug had been tested on humans. The drug they had signed up to test was called TGN1412, also known as Theraluzumab, and all was going well for an hour. All six men were given the drug via intravenous infusion over the course of three to six minutes. Within 60 minutes, the first participants suffered severe headaches, muscle pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, severe fever, restlessness, and rash. And after four, year, four hours, the volunteers developed hypertension, tachycardia, and the onset of respiratory failure. To understand what went wrong, we have to look at exactly what the drug being tested was, what it aimed to do, and how it worked. TGN-1412 is a humanized monoclonal antibody. What does that mean? Well, a monoclonal antibody, or MAB for short, is a type of immune protein produced in the lab that binds to a specific protein on the surface of a cell, called an antigen. MABs are designed to mimic the action of natural occurring antibodies. The term monoclonal refers to the process of creating an exact copy, a clone, of the white blood cells that produce these antibodies. Originally intended for the treatment of B-cell chronic lymphocytic leukemia, theraluzumab was designed to bind to a receptor on a specific type of cell in the immune system called T-cells, which play an essential role in the adaptive immune system. Theraluzumab would activate the T-cell, which would then mount a stronger immune response so we can fight a disease or infection better. This makes MABs like TGN1412 a really powerful tool in treating diseases, but as you probably guessed, it also requires careful testing and monitoring due to potential side effects. The exact same side effects that our six patients were starting to feel. 16 hours after they were admitted to hospital, all six men were transferred to intensive care with severe symptoms. One patient describing that he felt like he was burning. Another developed a ballooned head and looked similar to the elephant man. Another later lost his fingers and toes. The treating physicians attempted to reduce inflammation with potent corticosteroids and remove the drug from circulation with plasma exchange. What they didn't know at the time was that they were competing with what is known as a cytokine storm. What is a cytokine storm? Well, cytokines are pro-inflammatory molecules produced by our immune system. A little bit of inflammation is actually a good thing as it is part of the normal biological response to harmful stimuli, such as pathogens, damaged cells, or irritants. However, too much inflammation, well, that's not good. In a cytokine storm, the body produces an excessive amount of these pro-inflammatory molecules, leading to intense inflammation and the serious downstream problems that our six participants were experiencing. Mercifully, after 48 hours, the first wave of T-cell activation had passed and the condition of these patients improved significantly. And in the end, all survived with full resolution of their pulmonary injury and renal failure. The lessons learned from this trial have had a profound impact on the conduct of first-in-man clinical trials for potential high-risk medicinal products. 
Before first demand trials can be undertaken, there is extensive theoretical and animal testing required. Additionally, first demand trials must employ sentinel dosing, a feature whereby only one or two patients are treated initially and are observed for any side effects before the next patients can be dosed. This prevents a larger number of patients experiencing here too unforeseen severe symptoms all at once, such as they did in the Theralizumab Elephant Man trial. Ten years later, what was supposed to be a routine first in human trial resulted in the hospitalization of five patients, one of whom tragically passed away. This time, a French company, Biotrial, on behalf of Portuguese pharmaceutical firm Bial Portela, recruited 128 volunteers to take part in a clinical trial of a new drug called BA-102474. Great name. This drug was being developed for the treatment of various medical conditions, including anxiety disorder, Parkinson's disease, chronic pain from multiple sclerosis, cancer, hypertension, and obesity. BIA-102474, an experimental drug, was designed to inhibit an enzyme called fatty acid amide hydrolase, or FAAH. This enzyme breaks down endocannabinoids in the brain. Endocannabinoids are neurotransmitters that play a role in functions like sleep, mood, appetite, and immune response. The idea behind this experimental drug was pretty simple. If you stop the activity of FAAH enzyme, then fewer endocannabinoids will be broken down and the patient will naturally have more in their system. Put simply, the hypothesis, the hypothesis was that more endocannabinoids might mean less pain, less anxiety, fewer Parkinson's symptoms, for example. So what went so wrong? Well, the test was carried out in various phases. The initial phase consisted of single ascending doses that took place completely uneventfully up to a maximum dose of 100 milligrams. The first four in a series of multiple ascending doses also went absolutely fine. It wasn't until day five of the fifth series of 50 milligrams that things started to go wrong. One participant developed neurological problems and was admitted to the hospital. The next day, three of the four remaining participants had neurological symptoms and sadly, one patient died. The exact underlying mechanism that caused this acute neurotoxicity remains unknown. But what we do know is that BIA-102474 engaged numerous off-targets, which is essentially when a drug binds to a target it was not designed for. And as you can see, these off-target engagements can have disastrous effects. This incident led to the, re the re-evaluation of safety protocols in phase one clinical trials and has highlighted the need for improved preclinical studies to better predict the risks of novel drugs before giving them to people. Next up, and to round out our discussions, we have thalidomide. Well, strictly speaking, this isn't a drug trial that went horribly wrong. It's a drug that went horribly wrong because it was not properly trialed. In both previous examples, BAA-102474 and TGN-1412, were tested extensively on animals before humans. This might seem like a sensible idea, right, given the stakes? Well, most modern drug trials move from animal testing to human testing before they make their way out into the world. Sensible. This, however, wasn't always the case. Thalidomide. This was a drug developed in the 1950s by the German pharmaceutical company Chemin Grunenthal. It was marketed to treat anxiety, sleep disorders, and pivotally, morning sickness in pregnant women. The only catch, it was not properly tested for use during pregnancy on anything. Given that one of its marketed uses was morning sickness, it would probably be a good idea to test it on at least pregnant animals and then humans, or at least just the animals, right? Well, it wasn't. So exactly what was the issue with thalidomide? Well, when taken in the first trimester, it led to severe birth defects in thousands of babies, including limb deformities, eye, urinary tract, and heart defects, collectively referred to as teratogenic effects. An estimated 10,000 infants were affected by their mothers taking thalidomide during pregnancy, and that's a conservative estimate. Sadly, about 40% of these infants died around the time of birth. The world reacted swiftly at the discovery of this tragedy, such that thalidomide was available for only a few short years between 1957 and 1961 in Europe. Importantly, 
The, edi- the initial entry of thalidomide into the US market was prevented by a keen-eyed and principled reviewer at the FDA called Francis Kelsey. At the time, there was no understanding of why the drug caused these teratogenic effects. In fact, it wasn't until the 1990s that scientists discovered that thalidomide was a potent inhibitor of angiogenesis, which is the formation of new blood vessels. They theorized that this effect contributed to the missing limbs and other deformities. There are other several more complex theories, but that's a story for another day. The thalidomide disaster led to stricter rules for approving drugs and medical devices, as well as more awareness about the risks associated with drugs that were not properly tested, and most importantly, the need for better testing. In the UK, it became illegal for drugs to be approved without first being tested on humans. So sensical, right? In the USA, the FDA was given far more power and control over the approval and testing of new drugs. Additionally, patients now get more information about drug risks and must give informed consent. And countries globally have changed how they regulate new drugs. So despite its tragic story, thalidomide really changed the game. It's a big reason why we have a safe and rigorously regulated clinical testing industry, one that is designed to ensure that something like the thalidomide tragedy never happens again. Look, these trials are just a fraction of the thousands of clinical trials that go on every single day. According to the US National Library of Medicine, as of recording this video, there are a whopping 490,000 registered clinical trials, of which 190,000 were on drugs or biological interventions. These studies are the reason that we have novel treatments for diseases. So next time you reach for your atorvastatin, your metformin, your levothyroxine, or sertraline, Think about where it came from and how someone somewhere had to be the very first person to take it. Well, if you enjoyed this video and like me, have a really keen interest in medical science, clinical research and biotechnology, then give this video a like and subscribe to our channel. We released weekly educational videos just like this one and also podcasts with the best and brightest in the fields of medicine and human health. Thanks and bye for now.